I recently appeared on a podcast known as The Wake Up Call, and the co-host and I had a great discussion on libertarian strategy, and we thought you might enjoy it. So stay tuned. We've heard you recently describe four strategic options for libertarians, and we're going to focus on the political option last, but I want to focus on the other three first. So let's start with the strategic withdrawal option. What does that mean, and, and what are the pros and cons? Well, it's an interesting question. Libertarians tend to be, or, or the stereotype of libertarians is that we're long on theory and we're short on practical action or tactics or strategies to implement what we think uh, the the ordering of the rules of society ought to be. So I think uh, strategic withdrawal is an option uh, that people in Catholic circles talk about. I don't happen to be Catholic, but um, there's a, a phraseology called the Benedict option uh, where Catholics talk about, well, the culture around us has become so degraded and and so uh, antithetical to our Catholic values that we need to sort of start almost start physically self segregating into communities or regions. And of course, this is this has always happened in U.S. history. People have always sort of lived in in communities that mirror or reflect their own values. But um, it, it's the, so the idea behind strategic withdrawal is that libertarians could. Um, withdrawal as much as possible from the dominant political paradigm, which of course we oppose, and and try to live in communities, whether that's actual physical proximity or whether those are, are uh, online or digital communities uh, of people spread about made possible today with today's technology, to try to live and work and, uh, and socialize uh, within uh, more like-minded communities. So strategic withdrawal is the idea behind places like Lieberland, which is a small libertarian country that's being attempted uh, in Europe. Uh, it's the idea behind a project like the Free State Project, which was designed, oh gosh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now by a uh, Yale professor named Jason Sorens. And, and the idea was to get a lot of liberty-minded people to move to New Hampshire, which is a relatively uh, uh, sparsely populated state. And, and over time, a few tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of liberty-minded people could could change uh, the the landscape, the political landscape in a particular small state, uh, much more rapidly and more effectively than they might at the federal level. So uh, that that's that's the idea behind withdrawal. It's it's sort of um, it strikes some people as. Uh, as as bitter, you know, this idea that we're going to take our, our ball and go home, and it strikes some people as defeatist. No, 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 you know, we ought to be engaging the larger culture and the larger p political scene uh, head on at, at, at every turn. Well, uh, you know, a, a lot of people have tried that in the liberty area for a long time, and it hasn't much worked. So I think the idea of strategic withdrawal really appeals to a lot of people who want to have a more libertarian lifestyle, if, if that's the word, it, you know, while they're still alive, as opposed to constantly trying to build something for a future that they might not live to see. So how successful has this withdrawal option been, both in recent years and over a longer period of time? Well, it's hard to say. The talk I gave was very much a prospective talk. In other words, talking about strategies we might employ as much as strategies that have been employed. Uh, the Free State Project has gained some traction, and I think they've they've uh, had s some small legislative successes at the state level on on uh, gun control and the like. But it, it's very very tough, and uh, I would say it, it, in it, in a sense, it might be the least appealing of our options because even as libertarian momentum grows, even if the number of people who have been introduced to libertarian ideas grow, the U.S. population grows maybe even more rapidly. When I first got into libertarian thought in the late 80s, early 90s, the population was 280 million or thereabouts. Well, now it's 320 million. So if we've added 10 million libertarians since then, but we've added 40 million to the general population, um, you know, it, it's getting to be, uh, you know, you just got to look at the numbers. So if, if somebody wants to withdraw and, and from, from the fight and just enjoy their life as much as possible and lead their life in a way that that f seems right to them as opposed to beating their head against the wall in politics or or whatever it might be i, I say more power to them i mean what is what is liberty really about at the end of the day it's really about uh, li living your life a as you see fit so for people who try to make that happen to the extent it's possible 
in, in the in the current climate, I, I say more power to them. Yeah, I feel like this option revolves a lot around personal choices instead of kind of group decisions. That's one thing I kind of like about it. Uh, but let's go on to the next one, which is the winning hearts and minds option or kind of the education option. Right. And that's really what, what a lot of organizations like the Mises Institute uh, consider um, you know, our mission. Our mission is educational. We don't engage in politics or public policy. We don't uh, fret about this piece of legislation that we're, we're strictly here to promote libertarian ideas, the ideas of Austrian economics, and, and try to hopefully spread those as far and wide as we can. And we do that in the old days. You did that with physical conferences and sending people videotapes in the mail and, and that sort of thing. And in today's world, obviously, it's largely a, a digital effort, digital outreach to, to spread ideas. And, and from my perspective, obviously, I'm biased, but I think the educational model, winning hearts and minds, is in in many ways the most practical tactical approach to us because the cost of disseminating ideas has never been less and the ease of dis- the ease with which we disseminate ideas across you know the entire globe has never been easier it's now possible uh, for people to talk to one another uh, across borders uh, across time zones in a way that was just unthinkable even 30 years ago and i i think one of the biggest sea changes you 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 can recognize out there is that, you know, now you read an article in the New York Times, well, there's a comment section. Now some official or some big shot or some celebrity uh, makes a pronouncement or, or, or says something, well, there's a million responses on social media. So it's the digital revolution has been the biggest leveler, I think, for libertarians and, and for all, you know, for all people of all political stripes to sort of fight against the, the, the power structures that existed. So, uh, you know, we should never, we shouldn't look this gift horse in the mouth. We should realize that, you know, 30 years ago, you ha- you were NBC and you had to spend millions of dollars on studios and you had a, you had all these costs. And then Walter Cronkite came out and gave the evening news and Americans may have agreed or disagreed, but they pretty much swallowed it. And, uh, you know, if you didn't like what your newspaper said, maybe you, you mailed in a letter to the editor by physical mail and maybe they printed it. Well, that's all changed. You know, today we have instantaneous uh, responses and rebuttals and communication. We have thousands and thousands of seminal books that are available completely free online to read. Um, you know, the, the information revolution has not been friendly to the powers that be in society. Let's let's be honest. It's It's been the great leveler. So I think that uh, if I had to choose one of the four... I would choose education because I don't, uh, um, you know, no nobody wants to see change accompanied by violence. So uh, rather than try to uh, beat people about the head with stuff, we'd rather try to present them with superior ideas. And that's just a lot easier today than it used to be. No, it is. And our choice is largely education as well, uh, hence why we're doing this show, which is largely an educational endeavor. But the education option does have some cons to it, does have a downside. Uh, how would you describe the downside of the education option? Well, there, sure, there's lots of downsides. One is that it's slow. It's a generation-by-generation generation process. And as I mentioned earlier, the population might be growing faster. So it's, it's very, it can be very tough uh, for, for people, especially younger people who you know, really want some results and really want to see things happening to say, well, you know, that's great. You've got a 900-page book. Um, but, uh, you know, I, would like to see s- s- something more actionable in my lifetime now. So, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely, uh, an inertia there, a time lag that can be distressing to some people. There's also a, a, a divide, um, intellectually, right? I mean, even though we've never had more information at our fingertips than ever before, I mean, you're walking around with a smartphone, you've basically got every dictionary that ever existed, You've got world history, you've got math, science, language. I mean, it's unbelievable, but yet our reading comprehension, our willingness to read 900-page books, for example, is, is going down. Um, so in some ways, access to information is not making people smarter or, or harder working. Um, it might be making them dumber and lazier. So it's... Uh, you know, it's it's it is it is a double edged sword, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't yield the kind of uh, 
instant results that, you know, we might think, well, if we just go out and elect Ron Paul or something, we'll have this instant result. And of course, electing Ron Paul actually is a trailing uh, uh, action. First, you have to change some hearts and minds to even consider having people vote for Ron Paul. So that's why I I, I do prefer education. I think everything else is is downstream uh, from from the hearts and minds strategy. But I, I certainly understand people who, who say, hey, I don't have the patience for this. Another one of the strategies was resistance and kind of in the mind of civil disobedience. What can you tell us about that? And I mean, this is one that I kind of, I like, uh, but what, what can you tell us about it? Well, it's, it's a time-honored strategy across, uh, across human history to, to resist state power. And, and uh, the late, great Sam Conklin used the term agorism to describe b- uh, black market transactions. We tend to think of black market transactions as, uh, you know, drug dealing or, or uh, you know, thing, things that have a, uh, a, a uh, <clears throat> less than, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, things that are have a sinister uh, bent to them, but it, but in fact, agorism exists in a million different forms. The idea, um, you know, that one form of civil disobedience is to go out and have a march and and occupy a campus building or something like that. That's very physical and tangible. But there are a million smaller uh, hidden ways that people engage in resistance and civil disobedience and and what we might call agorism or black markets every day. Uh, if you um, you know, decide to build that shed behind your house and you don't go ask the city for the permit that you're supposed to ask for and pay them, well, that's a form of agorism. If you have a uh, an Airbnb uh, long-term tenant living in your house, but, you're, but they're paying you cash and you're not telling the IRS about it, um, that's a form of agorism. If you are, uh, you know, paying the local kid to mow your lawn, and he's just taking that cash and not claiming any income tax on his or his parents' tax return. That that's a form of agorism. So there's there's really a million things we all do every day to sort of impose ourselves against the state's will. And and maybe the most obvious of all is that on major freeways, we all just kind of collectively decided we want to go about eighty. We don't really want to go fifty five or sixty five because we're in a hurry. Uh, and, and for the most part, we do that just fine and safely. And and so if police don't really start pulling you over till about 85, then the sort of de facto agorist speed limit is 80 or 82 or whatever it is, right? It's not 65. 65 is the rule. That's the law, but it's being ignored. It's being flouted. So there's a million ways in our in our lives we don't always think about it. You know, it doesn't mean you have to go out and be a drug dealer, for God's sake. Uh, or or engage in in um, you know a massive open tax resistance or other things that are going to bring you attention from uh, people with guns very quickly. Uh, there's a million uh, a million small ways you can do this. And Sam Conklin, who's kind of the father of agorism, he he wanted to take it in his personal life and encourage people to take it to an extreme in their personal life. You know, don't have a driver's license, don't pay taxes. Um, you know, try to li- try to live off the grid so you're not paying. Uh, st- you know, state in, involved utilities, that sort of thing. Um, you know, for most people, there's a there's a whole range of choices of things they can do short of that. And you know, when you when you buy something on Amazon, and they don't charge you income tax because the seller doesn't have any kind of physical building or presence in in the particular state you live in. Well, in theory, at the end of the year, you're supposed to fill out what's called a use tax form and send it to your state. Um, not too many people do that. And it's awfully hard for states to, to track every transaction that occurs on Amazon. So, um, uh, you know, resistance and agorism is all about finding the cracks where they are and filling them and, and uh, you know, benefiting your life as a result. And I, I absolutely loved what you said about kind of the de facto law changing depending on what people do. And it's it's so true, you know, some politicians or some government official can say, oh, well, this is the way the world works. Well, if, if everyone just decides that, no, we're just going to do it our way, well, then that's the way it is. <laughs> you know, It doesn't matter what some random politician says or what some random law says. If everyone decides they're going to do it a certain way, then that's the way it's going to be done. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And there's a great term for that called Irish democracy. 
And as you can imagine, the Irish have a, a, a historical reputation for having their back up sometimes when uh, when authority exceeds itself. So I think Irish democracy is something we uh, we all um, need to practice when we can and, and say uh, when, when government does really stupid or really harmful things and tries to impose them on it, uh, oftentimes the, the easiest solution is just for the, for the, the population to sort of collectively shrug their shoulders and say, no, thanks. Um, and, and it's happened many, many times in human history and it's happening all around us in, in, in subtle, but, uh, but to me anyway, very interesting and powerful ways. Right. So for the remainder of the interview, or at least most of the remainder of the interview, I want to turn our focus to the political option. So first of all, what is the political option and what are the pros and cons? And then secondly, what is the reality of the political situation that libertarians face in the present day? Well, the political option is using old-fashioned politics, running uh, candidates for office and and working on uh, uh, promoting or, or opposing you know, certain pieces of legislation at any level, state, local, federal, um, and sort of trying to use the mechanics of politics. And it, it's a very practical, uh, and, and, you know, I understand the appeal of this. A lot of people say, look, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, governments tend to crop up throughout human history. We're probably going to have a government um, in America for whether we whether we care to have one or not, or whether we care to have one as large as it is or not. So what we need to do on a practical and realistic level is we need to engage in politics. Um, we need to get uh, libertarian-minded people into office, and even if they aren't uh, uh, perfect or what we might want them to be, uh, not, you know, someone like a Gary Johnson, nonetheless, that's the way to go. And and uh, we're you know we'd rather have Rand Paul in the Senate than just some um, hack. I guess Republican, well, probably Republican congressman from Kentucky or congresswoman, and so we, you know, uh, we chip away at the state uh, by fighting it within the system, and and this is this is um, something people have debated the wisdom of for years and years. I guess from my perspective, what I hate about it is just the 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 amount of time and money. And and human energy and man hours that go into it for for so little gain. I mean, d- depending on who you talk to, supposedly the Koch organizations, the various Koch brothers organizations, spent about four hundred million dollars on the uh, twenty fourteen election cycle in the House and Senate. Obviously, it wasn't a presidential year. Um, and and some of the things that they were hoping to get out of that, some of the victories would be, well, that a more Republican House or Senate would, uh, for example, vote against funding the Export-Import Bank. And the Export-Import Bank, for any of your listeners who don't know, is a really, really bad, really naked, crony capitalist system. Uh, taxpayers are required to back loans. If the loans go bad, taxpayers have to bail them out. Taxpayers are required to back these loans that are given to... Uh, foreign countries or foreign uh, businesses to buy U.S. goods. So it's this naked it's this naked form of cronyism. And one of the chief beneficiaries of it is Boeing. So taxpayers in the U.S. give a, a, a taxpayer-funded loan to a Middle Eastern country like Qatar or something. And Qatar buys 50 Boeing airplanes for their national airline. And so, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that's so open and obviously cronyous that, that, that the Cokes, to their credit, uh, oppose it and say, hey, this isn't what capitalism is or what it's supposed to be. Boeing should should uh, compete on the strength of its airplanes or, and, and the quality of its airplanes, not on uh, taxpayer subsidized loans. But, but yet, even though the Senate voted against reauthorizing the Export-Import Bank in a standalone vote, it, you know, it was kind of with a wink and a nod. And later on, the Export-Import Bank reauthorization, the money for it, was snuck back in and reauthorized uh, through a larger appropriations bill, where it was just one small part of it. And the senators say, well, I can't vote against the whole bill just because there's one bad thing in it. So, uh, you know, for, after spending $400 million to try to elect slightly more liberty-minded uh, people to the House and Senate, and now it's debatable whether that means Republicans, um, you know, at the end of the day, even a small, mostly symbolic victory, like getting rid of the Export-Import Bank was beyond the reach of these dodos in the Senate. Uh, you know, it, it just seems like the, the amount of time and money that people spend on campaigns. And when I see a young person, a, a really smart young person, and they're spending their time and energy going around, you know, putting up signs or something for some slightly libertarianish 
person running for Congress who most of the time doesn't even win anyway, I think to myself, well, maybe it would be better for liberty in general if that young person had spent that time and, and exerted that effort, learn, learning a foreign, excuse me, energy, learning a foreign language or uh, developing a small business that would make them uh, uh, wealthy or, or um, traveling the world and enriching themselves and, and seeing that, you know, America is not the only country on earth. Um, that, that's what gets me is what is the opportunity cost involved. There's, there's an awful lot of time and money and effort spent on politics for very, very, very little return. And I, again, I, I, I'm biased, but I think organizations like the Mises Institute are actually more effective in a, in a narrow sense in, in terms of what we do or purport to do, um, that, it, that we're actually more effective than the people who say, oh, you guys just want to talk about theory and we're out here actually involved in the game of politics and, and we're actually putting it all in the line. So, uh, look, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm ecumenical. I understand all of these arguments. And I, uh, so I think people should do what they're best at, what motivates them. If someone really likes politics and it, it just it excites them and engages them and they just say, oh, I love it. I want to go try to get this. You know, I want to go try to get Rand Paul elected as president. Knock yourself out. Um, it, it's not. What I choose to do, it's not what I counsel most young people to do, but I, I get it. I get it. But, you know, you mentioned what are we really up against? What's the what's the real state of affairs? You know, people, I think a lot of people don't really understand the, the, the way that the two parties have set themselves up for just perpetual power. I mean, there's nothing in the Constitution about parties. The Constitution just says, well, the House and the Senate will operate by the rules that they make. Okay. So over time, that turned into a system of spoils and patronage, whereby whichever party controls the most seats in, in the House, let's say where I worked, uh, gets to control the committee chairmanships. And so the committee chairmanships determine what kind of money gets doled out to what uh, kind of interests. And, and that affects how those interests vote and donate money and, and do all kinds of things. So, you know, there's nothing, there's, there's, not, there's no self-interest on the part of our political class that, you know, it's against their self-interest to yield power. It's in their self-interest to to consolidate power. So, um, you know, running, running, you know, somebody once said that Ron Paul running for president is like an atheist running for Pope. And there's something to that. I think it was, a, it was a, it was a very unique way of saying, you know, it's, it's awfully hard for liberty minded people to run uh, politically for to to evolve themselves in a system that is designed for illibertarian uh, gains to to consolidate and expand political power. So I, I see it both ways. And I'm certainly glad that Ron Paul was in Congress. I'm glad that Rand Paul's in the Senate. I'm glad that there's people like Thomas Massey and Justin Amash in the House. I'd rather have them than than someone else. So um you know I, I don't want to be too hard on it, but but we see a lot of young people at the Mises Institute. That's sort of our forte is, is high school, college kids, postgraduate kids. Shouldn't call them kids. They're oftentimes adults. But, um, you know, it's it's very easy for them to get excited about a political a campaign and then be sort of dashed against the rocks when they see that, you know, maybe we can't just – maybe we have to change people's hearts and minds first and then their voting patterns will change as a result. So that's my take anyway. Well, and even within the fairly grim reality of the political situ uh, the, the political situation that you laid out there, there is something very appealing about knowing that on a certain day and a certain year there's going to be a tangible result and a, a quantifiable way of, of viewing libertarianism or any other ideology uh, through a percentage through a number of votes that there is something uh, appealing about that. Uh, and there also could be uh, an argument to be made that if this political process is going to be played out and these elections are going to happen, and this is going to be the only situation in which a large percentage of the population even considers any of these issues, uh, then there is something to be said for having a libertarian or at least libertarian-ish voice in the mix when you have all these other voices in the mix uh, promoting other ideologies. Well, there's no question that that's true. And that's why I wish Gary Johnson was just a better speaker and a better spokesman and a more ideological guy and, and a better voice for this, because 
you know, you're right. Politics gives you a very concrete metric. You can measure your success. The, the, the Libertarian Party could say uh, success for us this year is Gary Johnson getting 10 percent or 5 percent or whatever it is of the general uh, the, the popular vote. You know, it's tough with the Electoral College to win a state. Um, you know, that that's a tangible metric. Uh, trying to have Rand Paul win a primary or two, that's a tangible metric. And, and that's that's appealing. I mean, we're a results-based – America is a results-based country. Um, but there, there's no doubt about it. But, um, uh, you know, we're not getting the results from politics that that we want. And uh, can, can we change that? I certainly hope so. Uh, but I think we missed a big opportunity. And no one could have foreseen that it was going to be Trump and Hillary. I guess we could have foreseen it would be Hillary. But, you know, even a year ago, 18 months ago, it was very hard to figure it would be Trump and Hillary. So – and that, in that sense, it seems like a like a real opportunity loss for the Libertarian Party this year because I, I don't think Gary Johnson is is and and you know no offense to the guy uh, he's a, a very nice man but I don't think he's he's particularly effective with the message. So for a Libertarian who's wishing to engage in politics in some form or fashion, uh, how would you evaluate the merits of doing that through the Libertarian Party? versus doing that through some other way, whether it be the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, an independent campaign, starting some new third party, uh, another existing third party. Uh, what do you think about all that? I think if you're looking at a political race, I think you should choose the party uh, <laughs> that's most likely to win in that district or region or state or whatever it is. I, I mean, they, the whole country has been gerrymandered to the point where um, oftentimes these, especially congressional districts at both the state and federal level are so, you know, 65, 35 or 70, 30 or a certain, especially in certain minority districts, they're like 95, five, you know, one party or the other. Uh, so it, it, if you're going to engage in politics by definition, you're saying to, to at least to an extent, I'm going to play the game as it is. So if, if, if there are some people who view that as a tremendous compromise in and of itself, I, I, I don't necessarily share that, whatever. But but if you're going to play the game, play it to win, or at least play it to have as much impact as you can. So Ron Paul would have said the exact same things to every audience he faced, no matter who was in the audience. He he never tailored or catered his speeches to you know appeal to younger people or older people, Republicans, Democrats, white folks, black folks. He always gave the same message. So and it would not have mattered if he was a libertarian, a Republican, a Democrat, and independent. So. To me, you know, just I, I would love to see libertarians running as Democrats. Uh, you know, there's no reason we should view libertarianism as some sort of offshoot of conservatism or the GOP because it's not. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to play the game, play it to win and playing it to win or at least do some damage uh, means playing the percentages like in baseball, putting the odds, you know, putting your best foot forward using the odds. So. Um, if you're running, you know, if you're in a in a heavily Democratic district, run as a Democrat, uh, and and then just say, I want to get out of Iraq. I want to end the Federal Reserve. Whatever, you know, you could say the same things you'd say if you were running as a Republican. And that kind of brings us into issue libertarianism and and focusing on single issues. And one thing that Adam brought up was the fact that you know politics sometimes gives you a microphone, and that sometimes people don't think about things except for, you know, once every four years they think about the issues and that's the only time they do. And I think it's kind of interesting because on the one hand, you kind of just want to scream out all of libertarianism and be like, hey, like, this is libertarianism. You should love it. This is why it works. This is why it's important. But I feel like if you just kind of lay it all out on the table, sometimes people are like, whoa, like this is too much. Whereas if you just focus on one thing, like marijuana legalization or war and peace issue, people can say, well, you know, I understand that. And, and I know that. I know how that affects me. And then from there, you can maybe grow on more ideas. So what do you think about single issue libertarianism? And on top of that, too, I'm going to add another question. The willingness to elect people who are running on single issues that maybe might be libertarian single issues even when the candidate themselves might not be very libertarian. So someone who, yes, they may promote the single issue of marijuana legalization, that might be the center point of their campaign, 
but the candidate themselves as a whole might not be so libertarian. So what do you think about all those things? Well, let me address the latter question first. Um, yeah, that, that can be tough. It can be very tough to say, hey, this candidate's really good on an issue that's near and dear to my heart. That's, and, and they're very libertarian on this issue. Like, uh, let's say they really want to bring marijuana decriminalization to a state that doesn't have it. But if on everything else, they're terrible. I mean, that you know, uh, they want to put people in concentration camps or something. That's obviously a, a joke. But I mean, uh, you know, you have to balance it. You have to weigh the pros and cons. And that can be a very tricky thing to do. And that can lead you, you know, down a road you don't want to go down. Um, but I, I very much believe... In issue libertarianism, I believe in coalitions. You know, take take the Iraq War. In my opinion, from my perspective, it, it it's one of the biggest blunders in U.S. foreign policy history. Not only because of the lives it costs and all the people with with uh, lifetime injuries, also the the cost of that war. It added trillions of dollars to our debt, but also the future costs. It, you know, the VA. Uh, veterans who are going to need lifetime care, and the the anger and hostility it created in the Middle East towards America. How how do we ever calculate that? How long will it take for that to wash away? Wow, you know, hard to say. But if we go back to that early two thousand period, two thousand one, two thousand two, when the Iraq War was being ginned up, uh, look, there were two very different factions. There was that kind of code pink. Uh, le- r- r- you know, socialist left wing faction with Cindy Sheehan people on the left, and then there was that kind of Pat Buchanan, what p- what is smeared as an, as the isolationist wing of the uh, GOP, and those two groups are very different culturally, uh, politically, in, in in terms of their worldview. But nonetheless, each one of them opposed the Iraq War and opposed it strongly. And it, you know, if there is a way to bridge that divide to bring those two groups together. Um, you know, and gerrymandering has made this tough because oftentimes candidates don't need to worry about the fringier groups represented or fringier voters represented in their districts. They can stay elected with the mainstream dolts. But, you know, if there was a way to harness that energy between these two groups who are very, very different and say, look, we can come together on this single issue and say, we don't think it's our job to roll tanks and planes into Iraq and try to remake uh, that country in our image as a constitutional democracy or, or, or whatever is, you know, it's, it's a cobbled together powder keg of, of Sunni and Shia and somehow Saddam Hussein has been doing it. He's a bad guy. But, uh, you know, if that argument could have been made coherently to the American people, um, you know, maybe a disaster could have been averted. I don't know. I don't know if you two agree that Iraq was a disaster, but from my perspective, it was maybe a disaster could have been averted using issue libertarianism. So that's just an example that pops to mind. Sure. Yeah. And of, of course, we agree that the Iraq war was a disaster. But I want to turn our focus to the Libertarian Party for a moment. Uh, you discussed this at, at great length at a speech in San Antonio, I believe it was. And, and we'll link, of course, to this uh, talk on the show notes page at wakeupcallpodcast.com slash strategy. Uh, but what do you think the goals and strategy of the Libertarian Party should be, and how would you describe the current state of the Libertarian Party? Well, I think they ought to change their goals and strategy. How's that? Um, look, if you're going to run a presidential, a big presidential campaign, and this is a perfect year to do it, then I think you should not run any other candidates. I think you should have no state and local candidates, no congressional candidates. This idea of having a slate of candidates is is absurd. They don't have the money. They don't have the manpower. It, it, get every libertarian in the country, every LP libertarian in the country focused on improving the prospects for Gary Johnson in your state. That's it. Just lay down the law, have some party discipline, say nobody else is running for anything. We cannot afford to siphon a single ounce of energy or a single campaign dollar or a single PAC dollar away from Gary Johnson's efforts. We've decided collectively as a party that you know every presidential year, that's what we're going to do. So that's that's my first piece of advice. The flip side would be, you know, really from the get go, it probably would have made a lot more sense for the LP to be a state and local party from from its inception. I mean, the the party was born out of frustration with Nixon in the seventies, what he was doing with the gold standard, um, the lingering uh, Vietnam War. So actually, the LPs was was birthed. It, uh, in, in in a very illibertarian time, and as a result, with some very libertarian principles, anti-war, uh, pro-sound money, 
Uh, so, you know, it really has wonderful origins. Um, a man named David Nolan, who's now passed away, was was really one of the founders. But, it, you know, it's when you're running for even, even a kind of a, a minor congressional seat today, if you want to run a decent race for a U.S. House seat, it's a minimum of 500K. I mean, that is that is really a minimum to run any kind of reasonable uh, contested uh, contested race. If you're not contested that, or you're barely contested in a gerrymandered district, that's different. But to run a real race takes 500K minimum. That's sort of just buying in. It might take a million. Um, so, uh, you know, and you have to win maybe 150,000 votes, roughly 125 to 150,000 votes out of a congressional districts, which are mostly se- around 700,000, a little more than 700,000 people. So, you know, that's that's pretty heavy lifting. But if you get involved in a local race for school superintendent, let's say, first of all, it might be nonpartisan, so you don't have to have the, the libertarian label necessarily. And it might be something where you can win with ten or 20,000 votes and a budget of $50,000 for your entire campaign in a, you know, in a county or a smaller town or whatever. So if you do the math and say, well, first of all, what, what, where can I have a bigger impact and affect my own life? Well, that's probably at the local level. And then number two is where where am I more likely to to have some actual success? That's probably at the local level. I mean, winning winning one hundred and fifty thousand votes and and raising five hundred k, that's a lot. That's that's a, a lot tougher thing to do. And and at the presidential level, I mean, come on, Barack Obama spent seven hundred and fifty million dollars in twenty twelve. The Hillary might end up close to a billion dollars. Um, you know that that's Gary Johnson can run a competent campaign with TV, etc. Although TV matters less in the internet age, it's still to for from my perspective for Gary Johnson to run a competent campaign, he'd need a minimum of fifty million bucks, um, and that that means people on the ground who are actually receiving a paycheck because they're professional, you know, people with professional campaign experience. Um, so that's. That's a big enchilada. That's a lot to ask. Um, and so if you're going to run a national campaign, run a national campaign only and cut out all the state and local. But otherwise, you know, if I could go back in time and try to tell the LP what to do since the 1970s, I would say become a state and local party because, you know, we we don't have a parliamentary system in the U.S. We have we have this two-party system of spoils. And so small parties, minor parties have a very difficult time um, getting any traction in the national legislature. So uh, it, it sure seems to me that it's it's a much easier sell uh, at, at the state and local level. So just a couple more questions before we wrap up. And since we've been mentioning Gary Johnson uh, here and there over the course of this interview, I want to focus on the Libertarian Party's presidential and vice presidential ticket for a moment, which obviously in addition to Gary Johnson also includes Bill Weld, the former governor of Massachusetts, who, as far as I can tell, has, has very few, if any, libertarian tendencies. What do you make of that ticket? Uh, what sort of ticket should the LP be looking to nominate if they are to engage in presidential politics? And what does it say about this ticket that they might be endorsed by the likes of Mitt Romney or <laughs> Jeb Bush or or uh, someone of, of that mm. ilk, uh, the possibility of which has been floated several times in recent weeks yeah. uh, all over the mainstream media. I be I guess I'll believe that when I see it. That's an interesting thought. Uh, you know, I think Bill Weld, former governor, uh, longtime trial attorney, I think he was he was installed. Um, I, I think he was installed by Republicans who want to have an, what they see as an adult in the room overseeing the process because they they, they figured he's probably not – Gary Johnson's not going to win the general. Um, he might he might take some votes away from one side or the other. And I, uh, but I really think he was, he was sort of put there to be uh, a, a hall monitor and to, to watch over things and make sure that uh, the LP – that the ticket didn't spend its time um, – you know, getting too far in the weeds on on what they would see as silly or goofy libertarian issues. Uh, I think he was also probably put there for his fundraising prowess, but I, I'm I'm yet to see that. And and frankly, I don't see what the you know from a fundraising perspective, people. If Rand Paul couldn't raise the money, I, I guess I have a hard time seeing 
how Johnson and Weld will. What what's what's the appeal that they hold that Rand didn't? I guess you know Rand, Rand couldn't continue. He didn't have the money to continue in the, in the GOP primary. So I understand that. But so they, you know, on his one his one appeal is that he's in the race um, and presumably uh, going to be on all fifty ballots. So, but from a from an ideological or policy position, I I actually see them in many ways as less libertarian than Rand. Uh, and 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 when Gary Johnson says low tax liberalism, when he says I agree with Bernie Sanders on seventy percent of of the issues, you know, I, I just cringe. I don't I don't think libertarianism should be presented as a left and right issue. Um, and I think it, it it's it's not only confusing to people; it's actually boring to people if it's not presented as a, as a principled and ideological perspective. If it's kind of presented as a mushy version of of uh, right winger meets left winger. Well, they're they're okay with marijuana, but they want lower taxes. And then I guess they're against the Iraq War. It, to me, that that just devolves into into mushy headed thinking. And I don't think um, that that that's what people want to hear. And and you know, Trump demonstrates this. People want to hear um, harder, more black and white rhetoric. And and. Fr- frankly, it's the I think the ideology, the principle behind libertarianism is the appeal to many people. So in a lot of ways, I think by being more radical, you actually end up with more votes, not fewer. I think that's the fundamental flaw of the Johnson Weld uh, ticket is that they they think that if they triangulate and they soften the message, they'll get more votes as a result. I actually think they'll get less. I think if you stick to easy, populist sounding sound bites like, look, Let's get out of the Middle East. It's not in our interest. It's growing government. It's getting people killed. And the Middle East is getting worse, not better. Let's get out. I mean, that doesn't take that that's a that's something that can appeal to an average person, an average voter. If you say, look, you know, the Fed is not your friend. We ought to end this thing. Uh it, it just serves a bunch of fat cats on Wall Street. And makes a bunch of bankers rich, but it doesn't really create anything for the economy. And we can see that because the Fed has pumped trillions of dollars into banks since the crash of 08, and they're still not lending, and the economy is still not growing. You don't have to. You don't have to make it more complex. I mean, what the Fed does is very complex. There's no. There's. You know, we shouldn't. We shouldn't uh, criticize an average busy person who's got a job and a family and all that for not understanding the mechanics of the Fed. Most economists don't understand the mechanics of the Fed. It's no crime. So you have to you have to sort of present these things in a palatable fashion and but you have to do it with some conviction and some belief and some fire. Um Bill Weld always looks like he's about ready to fall asleep. Um <laughs> kind of kind of like Dean Martin. <laughs> and and Gary Johnson is you know, some people don't like the peace symbol T-shirt under the jacket. I like that. I, I, I actually kind of like that. I could live without the sneakers that, you know, the signaling that, I, oh, look how hip I am or whatever. But, uh, you know, I just don't see the fire in the belly. I, I would love to see. I just imagine in a Trump-Hillary year, if we had a Tom Woods or a, um, you know, gosh, got, you know, rest, rest in peace, if we had a Harry Brown, um, man, it, it, just, it just feels like a missed opportunity to me. So do you think Daryl Perry would have been a better option or even John McAfee of the people who actually did run this time? You know, I I just heard a little bit about Perry. I wasn't I, I wasn't up on him, so I can't speak to him. I really like McAfee. I, I I you know, when you looked at the guy, he he just was you know, you could tell he was a, a legitimate guy, not a con man. He had uh, he had, I think, a face and and particularly his eyes, I really, to me anyway, evoked honesty. And a guy who's not professing to have all the answers, uh, or, or to be slick or soundbitey, uh, I, I thought he had tremendous appeal, and I thought he would do better at the convention, especially with the younger, uh, you know, Gen X. I, I thought he would resonate better with them because he's such, you know, he's a tech guy, and um, and he's a guy who's lived his life his own way, and I loved him, um, but I, it, it, would he get chewed up pretty bad in a in a general? Um, yeah, maybe he would have. And so maybe it's, maybe it's best for him. He can, he can, he can keep on being John McAfee, which is what we want him to do. So what do you think the best strategies for libertarians is politically or other, otherwise? And what are you, what are some reasons to be optimistic for the future? And what are some reasons to be pessimistic? Well, 
the biggest reason to be pessimistic is that if you look at human history and you look at the history of governance uh, in, in, in Europe, it was probably the best model for us, but, but now in the US, it, oftentimes to really pull people out of their uh, complacency, they, it requires some sort of economic shock or some sort of unpleasantness, a war, uh, an upheaval, civil unrest. You know, otherwise, as long as Facebook's working and ESPN comes on every day and we haven't, compl- you know, we have some kind of job and, you know, it's just, it, it takes a lot. There's just something very human. There's a there's an inertia to being human that makes us sort of okay with things as they are, provided they're not too bad. Now, as Americans, we're softer. We have, we have all the, the comforts of modern capitalism provides. So we're, uh, but I think if, if, if Facebook or, you know, was to, just to go dark for 48 hours, let's say, which in the, in the, in the course of human events seems like a pretty small emergency uh, relative to things like the Great Depression or whatever. But America would have a collective meltdown. I think that's how soft we become. So I fear, and I, I hope it's not the case, but I fear it might be the case that it's, it's going to take some sort of real material hardship or some kind of conflict in America to make us sort of wake up and, and clean house in Washington. Not that we necessarily install a libertarian government. We might install a worse one, uh, you know, strongman type situation, but to sort of wake up and say, hey, things can't just continue the way they've been going. I, I guess the reason I'm optimistic is because of the, the digital age makes it, it, what you know, it takes more than communication. It takes, you know, change requires certain public figures, people who are respected, people who are widely known to sort of come our way and start uh, accepting libertarian, promoting it. Uh, and I think I think we're really making some some great strides in that area. I think um, that, you know, as people see more and more, the state, the Western governments can't do what they say they, they do. They can't provide entitlements to uh, vast numbers of people over 65, especially with life expectancy uh, expanding. And, and they can't win wars to remake the Middle East or any place else. So, th- so the, there, there are two big reasons for existing, <laughs> war and welfare, they're, they're failing at quite badly. And it's going to unravel. It's going to get worse. Uh, people are not going to be receive Social Security in any meaningful fashion. They might receive it nominally, but in terms of what it's going to take to 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 uh, you know give them a social security check that that still has purchasing power I think is is a very dubious proposition. Uh, so I, I think as you know governments governments can't even keep the potholes out. Are they really going to remake uh, the Middle East and are they really going to come to grips with the entitlement uh, gap, the two hundred trillion dollar gap between our future expected entitlement layouts and our future expected tax revenues, and is the rest of the world just going to paper that over by buying U.S. Treasury debt forever and ever? The answer that's no. Uh, so as governments begin to fail, uh, I think there's two ways we can go. We reach a tipping point. We can go towards an unpleasant sort of police state model to maintain order, or we can tip away, tip the other way towards non-governmental solutions to our problems and. And I think with technology accelerating, and I think with the, our ability to communicate, it's harder to keep people in the dark about what's going on, um, and it's harder for the for, for the the powers that be to to have media gatekeepers um, and to have academic gatekeepers. Um, you know, I I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because, yeah, you know, we can bitch about the way things are, but let's face it, compared to our ancestors. I mean, we're not talking. We're not living through the War of 1812. We're not living through the Great Depression. We're not living through the Civil War. Uh, you know, I, I mean, when I think of my own uh, G- German great grandparents had no money, came here uh, from Germany with 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 nothing, uh, worked their way up through a trade school. You know, it was literally one of those things. My my great grandfather literally did one of those things. It was on a matchbook cover. There, you, you you know, your listeners won't know this, but there were there were little like ads on the back of matchbook covers for some electrical. Co- correspondence course training. <laughs> so that's what he did. So, I mean, for us to sit here with all these tools at our disposal and kind of bitch and wail and 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 moan about the state of things, that, I mean, look, the future's unwritten. We're not fatalists. We're not de- de- determinists. We're libertarians, right? So we have a million tools at our disposal. The future's unwritten. And it's, up, it's up to us to go do it. It's not it's not our place to uh, to moan about it. So, I, you know, I, I'm positive in that sense. I've got kids. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's my job to hopefully do a, some small part 
of uh, improving the the landscape for their future. So that you know, that's you know, color me optimistic, but in a but not in a not in a fake way, more in just a pragmatic way. We're we're not we're not that bad off. Um, I'm sure most of us all got up today and had electricity and running water and a roof over our heads. You know, go from there. Compared to our ancestors, we we're softies. All right. Well, I'm glad we can conclude on on an optimistic note. That's not always something we're able to do. So I'm glad that's the case with this topic. And thank you so much for joining us and being so generous with your time. Uh, what readings or resources do you recommend someone take a look at if they want to learn more about the topics we've been discussing today? And what are the best ways to follow your work? Well, I think if if you if you're interested in economics and the education and things, just come to Mises.org. We've got a lifetime worth of free books uh, on on PDF, HTML format, EPUBs. Uh, we have a lifetime's worth of, of videos and lectures. We have a lifetime's worth of articles. If that's what interests you, um, if you know, if you're not that well read or well versed in, in economics, we have a boot camp class available on our website. It's just a, it's just a couple hours of your life, three hours of your life. Uh, taking an online course. It's actually fun, interactive, and you will know more about economics than 99% of the population, even if you never read another book uh, uh, again. Um, so I would recommend our Mises Boot Camp to people. And I would also recommend to anyone just trying to, to get started, um, I, I would recommend Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. It's a short read. Uh, it's an easy read. It's available, uh, you know, free online. And uh, there's, I think there's no better starting point uh, for, for people who are interested in these ideas. And, um, you know, people are looking for something new. They're looking for something different. The two parties aren't working out. So let's, uh, let's change it. Mm-hmm.